Uh, welcome everyone. Look at this crowd. This is the largest crowd we ever had for uh, for Brain Health Awareness uh, uh, a night, um, particularly for Parkinson's. Welcome all of you. We have an amazing program for you. Um, uh, my name is David Park. I'm the director of the University of Ottawa Brain and Mind Research Institute. Um, and with David Grimes, co-founder of the Parkinson's Research Consortium, um, which uh, does all things Parkinson's all the time under the Brain and Mind app. So um, without further ado, what I'd like to do is to welcome Terry Marcotte uh, as the uh, um, beginning MC of this evening, this afternoon. Um, just a brief mention of Terry. Um, every year, he is incredibly gracious to come because he's right after going to go and have to do a, a newscast. Um, Terry, of course, is um, a bedrock of the Ottawa community. Um, he has been in journalism for 30 years uh, um, with CTV. Um, and he has a personal connection to Parkinson's, which uh, he will tell you about, and I will now give you the microphone, Terry. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for coming out. And uh, it, it is a, a, an honor to be here. And uh, David had mentioned that there is a personal, a personal tie with Parkinson's. And my grandmother back in the 70s had Parkinson's. About a decade later, my dad had Parkinson's. And it was incredible. The progress in treatment and dealing with Parkinson's in those 10 years, and you can imagine the leaps and bounds since then, um, and what, how far it has come. And there is still no cure, but it is moving along tremendously, and where are we going to be down the road? And that's why you're all here. So we'd like to welcome uh, all of our community, uh, doctors, patients, scientists, thank you for coming out. Uh, to the new inroads in Parkinson's research, the gut-brain connection as part of Brain Health Awareness Week. Thank you for coming out. This is a, a great opportunity to bring together doctors, researchers, sharing uh, their knowledge with donors, with volunteers, with patients, people in the community who are interested in this. And I'd like to extend a special welcome and we have uh, many of the uh, young scientists, the budding scientists, so thank you for coming out. And I'm uh, pleased to kick off this uh, inspiring afternoon. We celebrate the talent and promise of the next generation of researchers, four young scientists, all of whom working on Parkinson's related projects, have been awarded Parkinson's Research Consortium fellowships for the 2017 2018 academic year. Every year a call for application sent out to students working in Parkinson's research and the awards are generously donated by members of our community hoping to help find a cure for Parkinson's and without further ado I'd like to present the first award and it's my pleasure to welcome Sandra Crabtree from the Crabtree Foundation to present the Crabtree Family Fellowship Certificate to Richard Harris, and Richard is a postdoctoral fellow in the lab of Dr. Ruth Slack. <laughs> and it's uh, my pleasure to welcome my old friend B. Robertson, representing the Audrey Graham and Audrey Grant Fellowship to present the certificate to Daniel L. Kotze. And Daniel is a graduate student in the lab of Dr. Michael Schlossmacher. And I would uh, like to welcome now Ian Ewens on behalf of the Bonnie and Don Poole to, uh, Bonnie and Don Poole to present the Poole Parkinson's Research Fellowship to Caitlin Ventura. And Caitlin is a graduate student in the lab of Dr. Matthew Hollihan. And next up, the uh, Toth Family Fellowship. And presenting that, we'll have uh, Shelby Hader come up. And Shelby, we're going to hear more of Shelby, but Shelby has done so much for Parkinson's, and nice to see you. And uh, Shelby is presenting the certificate to Olanta 
McGarry, and Atlantic is a graduate student in the lab of Dr. Derek Gibbings. It's my pleasure to recognize the two-year fellowship awardees that are in their second year of funding. The Shelby Hayter Fellowship goes to, uh, was won last year by Zachary Dwyer in the lab of uh, Dr. Sean Holly, and the Larry Hafner Fellowship was awarded to David Liu in the lab of Dr. Adam Sachs. Congratulations to all of the recipients, and we look forward to future progress in Parkinson's research as a result of these exciting new projects. Congratulations. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little story, if I could. Um, what is the main story? <laughs> I think that's uh, John, right? Is coming after me? No, I'm... Okay. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story about how the Parkinson's Research Consortium came to be. Um, this was about a dozen years ago, and the first time I really actually ever met David Grimes, standing there in the corner, was uh, to discuss what's going on in Parkinson's in the University of Ottawa and the hospital, because at that time I was actually with the hospital. Um, and I met David, and we sat down and we talked, uh, and we decided to come up with a harebrained idea of starting this consortium. And we call it a consortium, by the way, not a center, because it's easier to actually move forward under the radar without all the regulations <laughs> that the university uh, has. So we did it. Um, and at that time, there wasn't a whole lot um, in terms of research and connections with the clinic going on a dozen years ago. We decided, David and I, that we couldn't do this by ourselves, and we needed the community. And so we hooked up with uh, this guy named David Simmons, and it was the three Davids, the three amigos. But there was actually a newspaper article about us. And uh, we sat down, we figured, uh, what are we gonna do? And um, we decided the first thing that we needed to do was better engage the community. This is a long-winded way of saying, um, one of the first people that we actually engaged was, in addition to Shelby, was Larry Hafner. Now you have to understand that David and I, and this David and this David, the other David was much more smart. I had no idea what we were doing. Is that a fair assessment? Okay. But we really did not. I'm a scientist, he's a clinician scientist. Uh, what do we know about starting something anew? So when Larry Hafner came on board, um, our board of the Parkinson's Research Consortium. He provided an amazing sense of direction and urgency to the board. So I'll tell you a little story. Um, there's a lot of talking in meetings, you can well imagine, particularly when we first start out. Uh, we would go on endlessly about what to do, what the plans were, et cetera, et cetera. And I remember one, uh, one particular meeting, Larry slammed his fist on the desk and said, listen, enough talk. Let's do something. Right? Let's do it. And that was Larry. He was incredibly generous focused in whatever capacity that he was in, whether it be with the Kiwanis or whether it would be with us. We've known Larry for a very, very long time. He provided that sense of direction um, that the PRC required. Unfortunately, this year we um, lost Larry. If Larry were here right now, I would tell him that we have done things. We've done some incredible things in Ottawa and for the larger community in Canada and the world. And I would tell Larry that it was because of his sense of purpose, his commitment, his generosity, that in fact this is happening today. 
Joanne? Thank you for being here. We um, incredibly grieve your loss. He was an incredible man, and um, he will be sorely missed. David, did you want to say anything? I mean, really, Larry was a really amazing person because he, he did have multiple medical issues. And, he was actually one uh, one of the original uh, individuals with young onset diabetes that started insulin as well. So he really had an amazing health journey, and I think through all his health problems, really uh, taught a lot of his uh, practitioners um, the importance of what we're doing and really trying to make sure we involve the community and, and patients in, in what we're trying to do. And this is spawned. You'll see the main part of my talk are integrated Parkinson care project and, and where we are and, and again it's really trying to make sure that we keep everybody engaged and get everybody's feedback to make sure we really are going down the right path so again Dave is incredible he's done uh, he wears multiple hats now he's not only the head of the movement disorder group the head of the PRC but he's also um, the head of neurology, all of neurology. So it's amazing that we're able to get him here. Um, I often uh, bug him on the phone, and I think he's uh, blocked my calls now. <laughs> David, take it away. Uh, so many people out for this uh, kind of event, and I think it really shows the community interest in what we're trying to do. And as, as David mentioned, um, you know, we've been at this for more than 10 years, and, and I must say our original focus really was uh, was trying to build our basic research program. And you've seen with the four awards that we uh, handed out uh, today, um, it really is a very strong program with many different investigators within the institution. And it, it really is, I think, hats off to David in terms of um, making sure that those links are very, um, uh, are, are very strong between what's happening in the clinic and, and what's happening in the basic research labs within not just uh, here at the university, but also at the hospital and at Carleton and, and around town. So it really is a, a, an important network that's being built. What I wanted to spend just a few minutes on was where we are with our, our very specific project that's just really in its infancy. And, and I think many of you have already been part of this as, as we're trying to build a better way of improving care for individuals with Parkinson's. And, and so we realized early on in the process that, that although we um, are doing a much, a much better job on the science side of things, we, um, we definitely need to make sure we're studying better ways to deliver care. And, and I have to thank my colleague, Dr. Meister, who I was trying to get uh, here to present instead of me. And these are definitely um, many of his slides that I've stolen from him. So there's a lot of things that we need to, need to do. And, and I think one of the big things we've been struggling with in the clinic is, and, and I must say I'm very embarrassed when I hand people back their follow-up slip and say, you know, I'll see you back in, you know, nine months, maybe 10 months, 11 months, and, and, it's, and it's, it's really clearly not optimal. Um, but there's a finite amount of uh, time that we have uh, in the clinic, and, and so are there better ways to deliver care than we have right now? Um, and this set us off on, on a journey of, of, of really trying to do a better job of, of, of delivering care with the limited resources that we have. And, and so certainly, one of the important things that we saw was we need to do a better care of, of integrating, a better job of doing what we're doing in terms of integrating care. We need to make sure what we're trying to give people is more personalized care. Everyone here knows that there's so many different things that can happen with Parkinson's that a one-stop, here's, here's the solution for everybody's problems is, is not going to work. So we have to make sure it's very individualized. And then I think it's also important that we, we can't do it in the clinic on our own. And so we need to make sure that we're transferring knowledge and making sure that patients uh, really um, can do everything they can to improve themselves. And so how do we do a better job at that? And so this is where we are with our model, where we're sort of thinking it right now in different modules, where you know we need to provide this idea of integrated care. But we need to make sure we always keep the patient at the center of what we're doing. 
Can we do a better job at sort of self-management uh, support? And so how can we do a better job with that? How do we get people, you know, with, with all the different services that are available in the community, we don't need to provide everything if there's already things out there that are available. And so how do we get people set on the right path with sort of navigating all these different options? And then I think as everyone's aware, you know, our, our digital health uh, uh, platforms are getting much better. There's all kinds of things out there. And, and should we be doing a much better job of making sure that we're you know, using the latest technology? I think it's also important, and you'll see through the next few minutes, that this is not, we, we haven't come up with the solution right now all, all at once. And so what we're doing is we're trying to build this program, we're trying to learn from what we've been accomplishing so far, and so we're hopefully continuously going to be changing the program to make it better. So I think, as, as many of you are aware, that Diane Cote, who's here, um, has been the, uh, the, the center of our, uh, of our project since we've started it. And, and so she, I've been fortunate enough to work with her now for, for many years, we won't say how many, um, in terms of looking after individuals with Parkinson's, and she's been a fantastic resource for, for many people here already. And so she's sort of helping us as the integrator of this, and, and we've certainly already had patient advisory groups to try to, you know, are we thinking of the right things? Are there other things that we should be thinking about? We've built a database to all the different community resources, and how, now that we've got this database, how do we make sure we're sharing it properly? Deanne spent a lot of time on gathering, okay, what are the other community resources that we can do a better job of accessing? And one of the things that became apparent is, is you know, for the self-help part of this, um, can we, we've, we've developed all these tip sheets. So the idea is, is there are things that you can work on uh, as an individual with Parkinson's to improve your quality of life. And so we've actually just finished up with the help of a student through the summertime, uh, writing all these uh, different tip sheets. So I know this is a very complicated uh, part of the slide, and it's in part um, I wanted to keep it looking complicated because it is complicated. And, and the whole idea is, is that there are many different options out there for clinical care, and we certainly in the Parkinson Clinic can't deliver all of them. And, and so how do we get people linked in to really do a better job in improving outcomes? I think the other half of the equation, though, is, is we do a lot of research. And, and so our clinical research program is expanding um, uh, significantly since Dr. Maestra has come here. And so we definitely have different trials that we're, we're working on in terms of new compounds. We have uh, biomarker studies we're doing. Um, many of you, we've stabbed you for blood samples in the last uh, nine months for some of the projects we're working on. And, and so we, we always want to make sure that we're tying back what we're doing in the clinic into our research efforts because that's really the only way we're going to move forward. And I think it's important to point out from the start is that this whole project is a research project as well. And, and so we need the funding to be able to do these things. And so we've been fortunate enough through um, our Parkinson Research Consortium that has been one of our, our, our funders for this project in addition to the uh, Brain and Mind Research Institute. So they've been very supportive of getting this project off the ground and again showing the, the importance of linking between the different uh, healthcare institutions and the university. And it really has been key and again with the community being so generous in their support to get this kind of project going. So where are we? We, um, we last year um, put 30 uh, individuals with Parkinson's sort of through our initial thoughts of how this program might work. And so when, when people sat down and, 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 and answered and went through these uh, different uh, uh, surveys and different questionnaires, um, you know, what are the things that come up as being things that they rank as being important that they want to better uh, manage? So things like constipation, balance problems, medication issues, speech and swallowing things. And so these are all common things that we could do a much better job in, in managing. And so with our initial integrated Parkinson care program, um, when you ask people at the end of their participation in this, did they think that we've done anything? And 75% thought that they were feeling much better or their overall care was much improved. We've also tried to study this in a little bit more um, a uh, formal way where we actually have done some qualitative studies and looking at you know how do we how are we doing in the clinic in terms of self-management 
Uh, how can we do a better job at self-management tools? And then this idea of self-management support. And so we sent out, and I think many of you probably filled out yet another survey for us, um, looking at uh, trying to answer these questions to collect this information. Um, we've had 19 people, so 13 people with Parkinson's and six caregivers also came in and spent a long time asking very detailed, answering very detailed questions and doing in-person interviews so we could co collect this information. So, um, so you know, almost 60% uh, felt, uh, people with uh, Parkinson's and the caregivers felt that, you know, they were ready to, to do more to manage their health care. Um, but we definitely had a lot of areas we needed to improve on. So we had need to do a better job of communication. We need to look at sort of the overall health management and, and overall health in, in general. Um, we can definitely do a better job of helping with access to community services, the idea of overall support for living well, and really try to do a better job of making sure that what we're discussing, other members of the healthcare team are part of that. Um, one of the things I mentioned was the idea of, of, you know, how do we get technology into what we're trying to do? Um, and so we did, uh, again, a few of you, I think, are here in the audience, helped, and we had a focus group where we had 11 people with Parkinson's, uh, three caregivers were there, we had somebody from Parkinson's Society, um, and the idea of, of okay, how, how can we look at uh, building a, a technology into what we're doing? And so. We really had three main questions that we were trying to get through this focus group is, you know, is there some way and, and thoughts about how we could use electronic data capture? I know some of you uh, are very upset, I think probably with me mainly, because you come into the clinic, we ask you to fill out all these crazy surveys before you come in to see us. And so this is, we've been trying to get a sense of how that could flow and, and, and we definitely need to do a better job to collect this information in a better way. Um, we also, you know, how do we use the IPCN in terms of a health resource uh, and, and again tying our database that we built in so people can actually use it better. And then how do we, you know, continue to collect this important uh, data but also keep people engaged in being involved in their care. And so this spawned um, after this focus group, uh, we then went out and we actually, there actually is within the Ottawa Hospital and the Ottawa Health Research Institute, a whole what's called the M Health Lab. I must say, I didn't know it existed, but their job is actually to help uh, clinicians and researchers build apps to provide better healthcare. And so we've actually uh, signed a contract with them, and they're actually helping us with this project now. And so they have a whole, actually, significant infrastructure to try to deliver. Um, and use uh, electronic means to better deliver uh, healthcare. And so we're very excited because just this past week we got the first uh, iteration of the app. Again, this is a work in progress and the initial part of this is going to be just collecting clinical data. Instead of you know checking off a checkbox on a piece of paper, people can use it, uh, an iPad or on the computer for us to collect this data directly. As we, as we launch the next phase of our, our study. And so, again, we're hoping to build into this app some of these electronic databases and some of these tip sheets and some of this uh, better flow of information to people. So where are we now? Um, we, we've gotten far enough along in the project that we actually now have, uh, and what we try to do with a lot of our research is, is we fund the idea of, of ideas here with our, with our locally raised money and then we actually you know to progress with your research we go out to different uh, um, uh, uh, different uh, groups for funding for our research and so we were very excited to, just this past summer we got a grant from the uh, PSI foundation to fund this clinical research project um, so this is sort of the first independent money that we've been able to get outside of our own uh, our own funds to be able to do this and so we're actually uh, People were in the clinic uh, this past week, but this is actually the first week that we're really embarking on this on this program. So we're going to try to get 100 people through this iteration of our Parkinson Care Network. And what we're really trying to do in this part of the clinical study is, you know, are we on the right track with trying to improve care? And always in the background, you need to make sure that, you know, is this going to be cost effective? So the government's never going to fund a project where it's going to cost them millions and millions of dollars. 
um, because we already know in Ontario that that's not a model that they want to fund is sort of having everybody in one place. Um, so, so again, this is, uh, this is uh, the next iteration that's just starting now. We've got our, our ethics approval for this project. So this, I know this is a little bit small, the, the font, but, but really it, the, the whole idea of, of the project is, is coming in to provide access. And so you're going to meet with Deanne um, and you're going to look at trying to um, uh, advise and, and she's going to sit and, and, and work through what the main issues are with the idea of trying to build a personal uh, uh, care map and, and focus in on what, what are the main issues then part of what Deanne's doing is then trying to assist in linking you up with the resources that you need, uh, being involved in some of the um, uh, mHealth uh, app programs to see if this is something that's going to be useful for people, and then really following up uh, uh, with that. And so we're going to, she's, people are going to come in, meet Deanne, spend like an hour and a half with her, try to get you on the right track with all the different resources that we can muster. <coughs> Um, and then follow people up at three months and then six months down the road. And so this other sheet here is really just sort of a template to how do we build and, and make sure people uh, were addressing what their personal care maps should look like. So we're, we're very excited with where we are with the project so far, and, and we've, uh, we have put a lot of effort into this, and I know many people here actually helped with us and, and put a lot of effort into this, and we've actually put in a very large grant um, to what we're calling our I Care PD study that's going to be a bigger Ontario-wide study and we're just in the initial phases of trying to look at this on a more national basis as well. And so we're, um, we're I think we're, we're really trying our best to come up with delivering better care. This is certainly not something that I'm doing on my own. Um, our own uh, research group and clinical group is expanding. Uh, myself, Dr. Schlossmacher, many of you know, Dr. Maestro, who's our, our latest clinician in our group, our, our amazing nurses, so uh, Jennifer, Deanne, um, uh, Jenny, and Darlene uh, are all part of, of helping with this. We have five research staff also working in the background, and certainly our administrative support are all key. And so, you know, I'm trying to give you a brief overview of where we are, um, and we certainly have a lot of work still left to do, but we are, uh, as I said, trying our best to come up with a, a better uh, way to deliver care. So, thank you. <laughs> David says we're allowed to take questions for, does anyone have a, I sort of went over a lot of different things there. Um, or we can wait till the end. Yeah. Um, I was just trying to make notes from some of your slides, and, and I noticed a particularly good one. I thought that during the appointment, you were asking people to be prepared to discuss what had gotten better, what had gotten worse, and there were two other things I couldn't read and write. So, coming up there. And, and so again, so you know, and then the idea of are, are there any other concerns that that are that are coming out uh, that might have been new as we're evolving since you really evolved through the process. And so again, we're going to be this is we're looking at collecting this information electronically ahead of time so that the time that you're in with Deanne can be focused in on on really trying to come up with problems uh, and solutions. To the, sorry, come up with solutions to the problems. Is Deanne the only person handling this? Yeah, absolutely. And so this is one of the things that we, we, we looked at in terms of, um, and, and so if this project is going to be successful, there are limitations to it. And so what we're looking at um, is how do we limit or maybe optimize the time with Deanne and, and how do we automate it a little bit more? So this is where the self-help part of it comes in. And so Deanne's job is really to get people started and give them the resources, give them the tools to then move forward. So, so this is the self-care part of it. So you know the idea is, is that you're right, Deanne can't look, at, uh, can't look after everybody either. And so it really is come and her job is to get you set on the, on, on the best path. 
um, but it won't be a continuous uh, follow-up because it just it, 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 she will be overwhelmed. Uh, and, and again, this is a model that I think is different than, than what we've been doing in the past. Yes. How are you selecting the individuals to participate in this? So we're, we looked, we were trying to decide, you know, it would be nice to be able to offer it to everybody who walked in the door of the clinic, um, but we realized, we're, you know, who potentially are the people who might need it the most. So we thought um, the people who were just diagnosed with Parkinson's, you know, often overwhelmed, don't know where anything is, don't know who to talk to, so we thought that would be a good group. And we also thought we would, we would look at people who are more in the moderate to advanced stages of Parkinson's, um, but not to the point where, where we might not be able to make as much inroads in terms of improving their overall quality of life. So we're sort of trying to get people, and, and so we actually have very set criteria that, that, that we've listed out in terms of who, who is going to be eligible. And, and again, that's part of doing a, a research project is, is this, you have to be very specific. So you're picking people as they come into your clinic. So, so Deanne is actually uh, going through it, and 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 we following through with the with the criteria that we have, and so that the people who come into the clinic, you know, the visits are busy uh, already, um, and, and sometimes I will forget to ask people, you know, say, okay, yeah, you're the right candidate. So some of you may get calls after your visit. Um, when I've forgotten to bring it up, but we're hoping to sort of give people the consent form to, you know, would you be a part of what we're trying to do? Yes? Yeah. Are there plans to have a website where, since Deanne is one person and there are many people that can benefit from the resources, where you can list the resources that are available for self-care? Yeah, so, so we've, we've been looking at a lot of different platforms um, you know, how, how do we get this information, this potential, this database, these tip sheets out to a wider audience? And so we're actually working with these M Health uh, people where we're hoping to have um, sort of two sections. Um, so sort of a, a general section where anybody could log on and, 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 and access this information and use the information. And then the other section would be people who are you know, involved in the clinical research study and they would log in with a number and, 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 and we would do it that way. So we're, it, it turns out it's, it, it's not as straightforward as we'd like, <laughs> so, but that's something we're working towards. Our goal for the PRC and the Brain and Mind, and uh, uh, certainly the Brain and Mind is going to support them fully. Um, what's important is that we need hard evidence that it actually works, because eventually, ultimately, we want the government to pay for it. Right? That's the plan. Uh, moving on. Um, it's my real pleasure to introduce our next speaker, um, Dr. John Wolfe. Um, he is an integral part of the landscape here at, uh, at, uh, at, in Ottawa. Um, he's a neuropathologist. Um, he's going to be talking about some very, very exciting um, ideas that are being um, uh, explored here in Ottawa and across the world uh, where it comes to the gut brain. Uh, just on a personal note, John uh, is incredibly busy. But every time, just like with Dave, whenever I phone him, by the way, I have uh, I have a lot of their personal phone numbers. <laughs> so when I personally call John, he's incredibly, even though he's so busy, he's incredibly helpful in uh, some of the research that we've done and in fact we've published. John uh, also is interacting with Doug, I believe. Doug, can you stand up? Another incredible researcher at the OHRI. Please come up and tell us about the exciting work. <laughs> well, thank you for that very nice introduction, David. Uh, I'd like to thank David and David and Michael Schlossmacher for inviting me to speak to you today. It's a real pleasure and a great honor as well. It's up. I have to tell you a funny story. Um, so before the proceedings began today, I was sitting in the audience. Somebody sat down beside me and said, looked at the screen and looked at the agenda and said, the gut and Parkinson's disease, who would come and listen to that? <laughs> <laughs> and she's right. So I have a, I have a, a big job today to convince you that there is, there is something interesting in here. 
So today I wanted to tell you about some new uh, ideas about where we think Parkinson's disease begins and how we think it progresses uh, over time in a dynamic way. And you're going to have to take uh, you know, the things I say today with a grain of salt. This is uh, all based on a hypothesis, but it's an intriguing one and one that has been investigated and is producing some interesting results. So, um, but before I begin that, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about what I do uh, from day to day so that you can see what perspective of uh, kind of what angle I'm approaching all this from. So I'm a neuropathologist, a clinical neuropathologist, which means that I diagnose diseases of the nervous system. And so my job involves two aspects. On the one hand, I do surgical neuropathology, which involves making diagnoses on tissue taken from live living individuals. And most of that is the diagnosis of brain tumors. That's our bread and butter. And then the second aspect is uh, autopsy neuropathology. So making diagnoses uh, post-mortem. Um, and my job is to, uh, in patients who had neurological disease in life, I make a diagnosis of that disease by examining the brain and spinal cord. And so to do that, what we do is we examine the brain and spinal cord. And so here we have a brain, and the first part involves uh, examining the brain from its external aspect to look for any obvious abnormalities. And then we systematically examine the brain throughout its entire extent from front to back with the naked eye examination. This tells us that there's any obvious things like big hemorrhages or infarcts in the brain. But the most important part of the examination comes when we look at sections of the brain under the microscope. And this is where we really come up with a diagnosis. Hopefully. In some cases, we don't. And my area of particular interest is in the diagnosis of neurodegenerative diseases. And so what you see here uh, is a section of the brain from a patient who suffered from Alzheimer's disease in life. And so these brown blobs that you're seeing are um, a protein called tau protein. And we're able to label that protein with a technique we use in the lab, and it labels brown. And so these blobs of tau protein are the neurofibrillary tangles that happen in patients with Alzheimer's disease. And so this picture tells us two very important things. The first thing it tells us is it conveys the concept that the common theme pathologically for all neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal dementia, and Parkinson's disease is this abnormal clumping together of proteins that are normally expressed in brain cells. Okay, so we all express these proteins, but for some reason in these diseases they clump together or aggregate. And when they do that, they form these clumps, what we call inclusion bodies, that we can see under the microscope and render the diagnosis. Hopefully. So this is tau protein that aggregates in Alzheimer's disease. In Parkinson's disease, it's different. <laughs> so this is what my colleagues in anatomical pathology think I do. <laughs> what do I actually do? <laughs> so this handsome but her suit fellow uh, here on the left is James Parkinson who is credited with the initial description of the motor features of Parkinson's disease, which are effectively conveyed in this old wood etching here, and it consists of tremor, rigidity, akinesia, or poverty, or slowness of movement, and postural problems, postural instability. And those symptoms are caused at the pathological level by a loss of brain cells or neurons from a part of the brain called the substantia nigra. This is basic stuff, most of you know this. Um, so on the right you're seeing a part of the brain called the midbrain in a normal 70 year old individual and you see this black line here, this black line is something called the substantia nigra. And on the left we have a 70 year old patient with Parkinson's disease and you can see the loss of pigment from that nucleus. And the loss of pigment happens because these brain cells, or neurons, in the substantia nigra have a brown pigment inside of them. And these brain cells produce a chemical messenger called dopamine. So when they die in Parkinson's disease, here on the left, you get a loss of this chemical messenger called dopamine. And that chemical messenger is sent 
from the brain cells in the substantia nigra along their, it's called axons, they have a long process that extends all the way to structures called the basal ganglia. And it releases the chemical messenger dopamine onto the basal ganglia and controls the quality of movement, controls other things as well, as we'll see. In Parkinson's disease, because of the loss of these neurons, you get a loss of this input, this dopamine input to the basal ganglia. And that's why patients with Parkinson's disease get DOPA. DOPA is a precursor to this dopamine chemical messenger. It's merely replacing what was lost in the pathology. Uh, the pathological hallmark of Parkinson's disease is shown here. Um, and what you're seeing here is a irritating little message that keeps coming up. <laughs> but also, um, you're seeing these round or kind of oval clumps or blobs inside of the cell. You see these in a cell that survive the insult in Parkinson's disease in those uh, substantia nigra neurons. And these globs of protein, these inclusion bodies, if we call them, are, um, were described by this fellow, uh, Frederick Louis. And so we call these Louis bodies, and they're the pathological hallmark of Parkinson's disease. Now, anybody living with Parkinson's disease and any family of a patient with Parkinson's disease can tell you that it's more than just motor disorders or motor uh, symptoms. Um, these patients suffer from cognitive problems, some have visual hallucinations, some have mood disorders, not all of course, some have problems with smell, pain, perception, and many have sleep disorders very early on in the disease process. Patients with Parkinson's disease also have problems below the neck, right? So there are a lot of um, patients who experience autonomic problems, problems with their heart rate, blood pressure, constipation is a big problem in Parkinson's disease, and problems with uh, urinary um, tract function as well. Some of these symptoms in the periphery occur years and sometimes even decades before um, David could speak more to this, obviously, um, before the motor symptoms show up. And interestingly, the pathology that we see that characterizes Parkinson's disease can show up in the nerves that supply those peripheral organs years and even decades before it shows up in the brain. The cause of Parkinson's disease is unknown. We don't know what causes it, except in very rare cases. There's an undeniable role for genetic factors, and some genes when mutated, will cause Parkinson's disease. So we know that for a few genes. Um, but for the vast majority of cases, 90% of the cases we call sporadic, meaning we don't know what the uh, cause is. There's also uh, thought to be an important role for environmental factors, for example, some toxins. Um, Parkinson's disease is more common in uh, people who are raised on a farm. Pesticides have been implicated in the disease process. And our current thinking about what causes it is that some environmental factor or factors conspires with a susceptible genetic background. Okay, so something in the genes is responding to the environmental insult to result ultimately in, in the disease. That's not a very satisfactory explanation for what's happening. It's pretty vague. One thing we do know about um, the cause of Parkinson's disease is that there's a central role for a protein that's present in neurons called alpha synuclein. So alpha synuclein is a protein that's present in the brain cells of all of us sitting in this room. It has a normal function. You think it's involved in releasing chemical messengers from neurons. In Parkinson's disease, for reasons we don't understand, the alpha synuclein protein, like tau protein in Alzheimer's disease, clumps together, forms these clumps that we can see under the microscope as Lewy body. So here, I'll just draw your attention to this picture. We have a neuron from the substantia nigra. It has this pigment in it. This is normal. But these aren't normal. These are the Lewy bodies. And they're staining in this picture. They're staining with a, a, a stain that we have for alpha synuclein. So alpha synuclein is the core protein of these Lewy bodies. It's aggregating and it's forming these Lewy bodies. And it's damaging neurons, brain cells. So our thinking about the kind of temporal progress of Parkinson's disease uh, was revolutionized by a, uh, a neuropathologist called Heiko Brack. And what he 
showed was that um, these Lewy bodies and this alpha synuclein clumping together doesn't only happen in the substantia nigra of the brain, but in fact it happens in other areas. And he showed that it probably begins in an area called the olfactory bulb, lying just above the nose, and in an area of the lower brain stem called, this is a big one, the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus nerve. So the dorsal motor nucleus, or DMN, is a structure in the brainstem that gives rise to a long nerve called the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve goes down into those peripheral organs and supplies them with nerve innervation. So that's where the origin of this vagus nerve is. Now over time, what he demonstrated is that Lewy body pathology progresses from these areas, the olfactory bulb and the lower brainstem, and goes along synaptic pathways, long neuronal pathways, to higher and higher centers in the brain to involve the substantia nigra, the resulting motor symptoms. And then in some people, even beyond there, it spreads through the cerebral cortex, resulting in some patients in cognitive disturbances and emotional disturbances. So we have this spatio-temporally dynamic process, what used to be a static process of disease in the substantia nigra, is now known to be a process that involves the entire brain and starts not even in the substantia nigra but in these other sites and spreads over time to the substantia nigra. So how does this spreading process occur? Oh geez. Okay, so, um, so I've had the fortune to have many talented graduate students uh, come through our lab and a lot of them are really good at PowerPoint presentations, <laughs> animation, beautiful. So I tried my hand at this and uh, it's lame, but I, I hope it gets the message across. You'll have to bear with me. So let's pretend that this blue coil is the normal alpha synuclein protein, the one that's present in you and I, right? Something represented by this yellow lightning bolt happens to the alpha synuclein protein in a very rare individual, though less than 5% of cases, we know what that yellow lightning bolt is. So, uh, for example, a mutation in the gene that makes alpha synuclein is seen in a very small proportion of cases of Parkinson's disease. And that mutation confers on the protein an increased propensity to aggregate and causes the disease. So in that case, we know what the yellow lightning bolt is. We're fortunate here in Ottawa that we have very many very talented scientists, much smarter than I am, uh, like David Park and Michael Schlossmacher and Mark Ecker and Derek Gibbings and Doug Gray and I could go on and on, uh, who are trying to find out what this yellow lightning bolt is. Um, but as of now, we don't know. In any case, what it does is it converts the alpha synuclein protein to an abnormal form. It makes the three-dimensional shape of alpha synuclein change into a new form, shown here in red. And this new form of alpha synuclein is toxic to neurons, and it has a propensity to aggregate with itself, so it clumps together. Not only can it aggregate with other abnormal alpha synuclein proteins, but it also has the ability to bind to normal alpha synuclein, and through an ill-defined molecular templating mechanism, convert it to the abnormal form. And this is a bad thing. You can see how this process could cascade, right? So now you have two bad alpha-synuclein molecules, and so on, and so on, and so on. So the aggregation process continues until we get little clusters of alpha-synuclein that we call oligomers that consist of from two to 10 molecules of alpha-synuclein. And these, we think, are the real damaging things. These are the things that really damage brain cells. We can't see these under the microscope yet. They're too small. But this process of aggregation goes on until you get the formation of these fully formed Lewy bodies that we can see under the microscope and make the diagnosis of the disease. So that's not the end of the story. So that happens within cells, but we now have evidence that this process can transmit between cells as well. So what I've shown you here, what I'm showing you here is a simplified neuronal pathway. So we have two brain cells connected to one another, and this patient has early Parkinson's disease. So the downstream neuron here, downstream brain cell, has a Lewy body in it, and it has abnormal alpha synuclein. 
We now know that this alpha cytonuclein can enter the extracellular space, cross the connection between the two, and enter the upstream neuron where it binds to normal alpha cytonuclein in the upstream neuron, converts it to the abnormal form, and inculcates the upstream neuron into the pathological process. So you can see how through this mechanism an entire neuronal pathway, an entire pathway can be involved, an entire interconnected pathway. And this is how we think the disease spreads through the brain. But alpha cytonuclein is not only present in brain cells, it's also present in the nerves that come from the brain and make connections with all of the peripheral organs. So researchers were interested to know whether in Parkinson's disease there was evidence that alpha cytokine was pumping up in the nerves of the peripheral organs. And one of the areas that they found that they found the most clumping up of alpha cytokine was in the gastrointestinal system, including the large colon, the small intestine, the stomach. And in fact, the gastrointestinal system has just a massive nervous system all its own that we call the enteric nervous system. And the important thing to see here, so this is showing the wall of the intestine. The important thing here is that this massive nerve, uh, network of nerve fibers in the gastrointestinal system comes from that vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve comes down and then sends out these processes to make the enteric nervous system basically. It connects with other nerve cells in there. So the origin of this is this vagus nerve. Uh oh. So, lo and behold, researchers did find that uh, in patients with Parkinson's disease, there was Lewy pathology in neurons of the enteric nervous system. Not only that, but Studies done uh, in so post-mortem studies show that these Lewy bodies, so alpha cytokine aggregation was happening years and even decades before the same pathology was visible in the brain. Okay. So I'm just going to hop to this. This is the current iteration of what's called the BRAC hypothesis for Parkinson's disease. Okay. This is what you need to take with a grain of salt. Not everybody believes, this is not dogma, not everybody believes this hypothesis. It's a model. It's a model that informs future work to prove or disprove it. So let's, let's see what it says. So here is the, is the gastrointestinal system with the enteric nervous system. This is the vagus nerve, which is the origin of the enteric nervous system. And this is the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, where the cell bodies, the origin of that nerve, are. So what happens, we have our yellow lightning bolt again. Something happens in the periphery to cause alpha synuclein to clump up in the, brain, in, the, in the nerves of the enteric nervous system. Through this uh, mechanism I showed you a couple slides ago, this process is transported or propagates along the vagus nerve to show up in that dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus in the, in the uh, lower brainstem. From there, the process continues to spread upward in the brain to a structure called the locus ceruleus, and ultimately onto the substantia nigra, causing the typical motor symptoms of the disease. And from there, in some individuals, to even higher levels, including the cerebral cortex. And this occurs over decades, well, years to a decade. So this was a welcome concept because it provides a window of opportunity, time-wise, because if you could interrupt this nerve, theoretically, if this is true, you should be able to either slow down or completely prevent the disease process if you can catch it early enough. This is why biomarkers are so important. So biomarkers are things that we can detect in living patients. The only way we have to diagnose Parkinson's disease currently is post-mortem. We need to be able to diagnose it, to diagnose it in living patients so that we can administer treatments to stop the disease. If you don't know a patient has the disease for sure, you can't give them the treatment. And in fact, this uh, interruption of the vagus nerve has been performed in animal models of Parkinson's disease and has been shown to prevent the development of brain pathology in these animal models. 
And fortunately or unfortunately, we have a living, breathing human model of this uh, procedure. So um, a treatment for gastric ulcer used to be cutting the vagus nerve, what's called vagotomy, a surgical procedure. So with the BRAC hypothesis, some researchers wanted to determine whether patients who had vagotomy have a reduced risk of developing Parkinson's disease. And indeed, that turned out to be the case. A reduced risk, but not a completely abolished risk. And we're very interested in this because one of our interests is in the distribution of alpha-synuclein in the peripheral nervous system. And so we, what we studied was um, the distribution of alpha-synuclein in the enteric nervous system, in the gastrointestinal system, in normal individuals, not in individuals with Parkinson's disease, normal individuals like you and I, and we wanted to know what areas of the gastrointestinal system had the highest amount of alpha-synuclein, had the densest plexus of alpha-synuclein nerves. Because if we know that, we might know where in the gastrointestinal system the disease process is more likely to start. So what we did was we took sections from, um, these are surgical specimens from patients who had undergone gastrectomy for gastric cancer, as well as patients who had gone, undergone right hemicolectomy for cancer as well. And these specimens contain areas of, uh, of pieces of small intestine, large intestine, and appendix. And then the gastrectomy specimens have uh, pieces of stomach. And what we found to our surprise was that this little organ, the vermiform appendix, had the highest density by far of these alpha synuclein containing nerve fibers. So the wall of the appendix had this dense plexus of nerve fibers. And this is the same appendix that you get removed when you have appendicitis. And so here is a high power um, microscopic view of these nerve fibers in the wall of the appendix that contain alpha synuclein protein. Now remember, this is a normal non Parkinsonian um, individual. We know that, um, one of the things we know is that mutations in alpha synuclein can cause um, Parkinson's disease. One of the mutations that causes Parkinson's disease is if you have a double the amount of, we call it a duplication. So if you have a duplication or a triplication of the alpha synuclein gene, those patients get Parkinson's disease. We call this a dosage effect. So the more alpha synuclein you have, the more likely it is to aggregate this is a simplification, and the more likely you are to get Parkinson's. So if you have double dose, you'll get Parkinson's disease. Um, so this amount of synuclein in the appendix, does it make it more prone for alpha synuclein aggregation to occur in response to some environmental factor? So we would ask the question, does the rich endowment of alpha synuclein in the appendix have implications for Parkinson's disease? So it has a rich alpha synuclein innervation, it has a direct innervation from that nucleus, the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus. So it sends its axons right down into the appendix. There's good evidence for an important role for the immune system in Parkinson's disease, as many of you know. And the appendix is an immune organ. Its wall is lined by uh, lots of immune cells. And finally, the vermiform appendix, a lot of you heard, have heard about the role of the microbiome the intestine, particularly the intestinal microbiome in human health and in all kinds of diseases. It's been implicated in Parkinson's disease and the appendix is a storehouse for the bacteria that make up the microbiome. So with all of this, people went on to actually study whether patients who had had an appendectomy are at lower risk of developing Parkinson's disease. And it's sad to say that, unfortunately, there were mixed results. The first study in 2015 showed, yeah, that indeed, patients who had an appendectomy had a reduced risk of developing late-onset Parkinson's disease. But later studies, like this one in 2015, and this one from Sweden in 2016, showed no association. In fact, this one showed a slightly increased risk of Parkinson's disease in patients who had undergone an appendectomy. Does that rule out a role for the appendix in the disease? Not necessarily. So again, a lot of you have heard about the role of the microbiome. And so the microbiome consists of the, um, 
just billions and billions of microorganisms that colonize us. You and I are walking bacterial factories. Um, and so uh, the entire gut is lined by not only bacteria, but also viruses and fungi. Uh, and these have an important role in disease. And uh, the microbiome has been convincingly implicated in Parkinson's disease. So in a mouse model of Parkinson's disease here published in Cell, the um, gut microbiome it has been crucially implicated in um, regulating the symptoms of the disease and the pathology of the disease. Human, in human uh, Parkinson's patients, the composition of the gut microbiome differs from what we see in controls as well. So there's good evidence that the microbiome might be involved. And as I mentioned, the appendix, this is more important in countries that suffer from bacterial-induced diarrheal illness. But in that setting, the gut microbiome with diarrheal illness gets depleted. And studies have shown that it's the appendix that represents a safe house in this situation. It stores um, gut mi microbacteria and replenishes the gut with the microbiome. So, what this means is that the microbiome of the appendix reflects the microbiome of the gut. So is it possible that patients with Parkinson's disease have a different intestinal bacterial makeup than those uh, without something we want to look at? There's one other important uh, aspect to this study, and that recently it's been demonstrated that alpha-synuclein protein, we don't know entirely what its normal function is, but one of the functions that's been revealed recently is an antimicrobial function. The protein is able to fight bacteria and viruses. This was shown first by this group, but has also been shown in our, uh, by our own Michael Schlossmacher in his lab. So this ability to fight um, microorganisms is interesting because when there's an infection and inflammation, what happens is that alpha-synuclein protein is upregulated. So the expression of alpha-synuclein gets enhanced in response to the infection and the inflammation. And this enhancement is thought to help to fight the bacterial infection. So is it possible that in the context of the inflammation that happens in the appendix, that that, that explains why we see so much alpha synuclein in the wall of the appendix. Just an idea, theory. And could that have something to do? So in other words, in patients who have appendiceal inflammation, could that upregulate alpha synuclein, and cause it to aggregate? So could there be a relationship between a history of appendicitis and Parkinson's disease? That's a far flung, crazy idea, but something was. And I'll just finish this part of the talk with a little known factoid, and that is that the initial description of acute appendicitis was by John Parkinson in collaboration with his father James. They wrote the first clinical description of acute appendicitis. So whether this represents mere coincidence with the present talk or a true example of true prescience will remain to be seen. So uh, I'd just like to finish the talk with um, so, uh, telling you about some of our own work in the lab and um, so most of the work I've told you so far is observational and correlational stuff and crazy hypotheses uh, derived from human uh, tissue but to really study the mechanisms we need to turn to uh, studies in lower animals like mice and cells and so to do that I've been fortunate over the past almost 20 years now um, to be um, collaborator with this handsome fella here. Uh, this is Doug Gray. He's a senior scientist at the uh, OHRI. And Doug is um, he's a molecular biologist. He's also a brilliant musician. Um, but he uh, has a special um, expertise in making transgenic protein, so genetically modified protein constructs, and making genetically modified mice. And uh, so for example, here are uh, two embryos, mouse embryos, uh, the one on the right has been genetically modified to express a green fluorescent um, protein uh, so that when you put it under ultraviolet light, it fluoresces bright green. So we wanted to exploit this technology 
to see if we could monitor and visualize this process of alpha synuclein aggregation. Can we use this fluorescent technology to do that? And so to do that, we employed a technology, the big term for this is called uh, bimolecular fluorescence complementation. You know, I, 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 I can tell the med students, don't write that down. <laughs> and so what that involves is taking a molecule of alpha synuclein, fusing it to one half of a fluorescent protein called Venus, fluorescent is bright yellow, taking another synuclein molecule, fusing it to the other half, so that when the two alpha synuclein molecules come together, you get reconstitution of the entire protein, the entire fluorescent protein, because neither of these fluoresces on its own, and then you get fluorescence. So fluorescence equals alpha synuclein clumping together. So, Here's some cells in culture. Doug made this movie. And these cells have been infected with that alpha synuclein fluorescent construct. And when they're exposed to the pesticide rotenone, which we know causes alpha synuclein to clump together, we get yellow fluorescence. So for example, look at this cell here. After we add rotenone, you see that it starts to fluoresce yellow. Some of the cells are already fluorescing. I mean, in culture, culture is inducing alpha synuclein aggregation even without any kind of stimulus. And thanks to a brilliant uh, laboratory um, research associate, uh, Jose Coulomb, uh, we have our first mice that express this protein in their nervous system. Unfortunately, I don't have any pictures from them yet of their, their brains. And what we're ready to do studies on them and we've hired a brilliant graduate student by the name of Kiana Mao, who uh, that will be her entire project, is studying the aggregation of alpha synuclein in these mice. And one of the things we want to do, what you're seeing here is another movie that Doug made, and so this is a, a section, this is a segment of intestine from a mouse, and we can measure the amount of time it takes, just back that up a second, try it again can measure the amount of time it takes for this food pellet to be passed along the intestine. So we can quantify the function of the gastrointestinal tract and then uh, correlate it with the pathology that we see in the wall of that, so the fluorescence that we see in, in the wall of the, the intestine. And so we hope that this mouse model will help us not only understand this temporally dynamic process that causes Parkinson's disease, but that it will lead the way to identifying some compounds that can treat the disease, in other words, stop this, uh, this spreading of alpha synuclein. And so just to finish, I'd like to thank uh, the funders of this uh, project. Uh, really big special shout out to the PIPR, Partners Investing in Parkinson's Research. They've been extremely helpful, um, and they're funding this project. Um, um, and I'm very extreme, we're extremely grateful to them, the Parkinson's Research Consortium, of course, the CIHR, Parkinson's Society of Canada, and the PSI Foundation. And thanks to all my um, very valued collaborators. And this is just a shameless plug. Uh, my son is an artist, and this is one of his most recent pieces. And I will go to the website and buy some art. <laughs> Be a patron. Thank you for your attention. Any other questions? If uh, you'd like to ask that of uh, Dr. Wolf. So, a couple of days ago, I was on the same problem how other folks saying, well, you don't have to wait for the case to die, you can do imaging on that uh, expensive to go over to research, but you can do it in vivo. Is there anything like that on the horizon for Parkinson's? Sure, absolutely. So I, I spoke just briefly about biomarkers. Um, so for, for Alzheimer's disease, uh, they're, they're getting closer, um, but still definitive diagnosis uh, still relies on post-mortem examination for Alzheimer's disease. In large groups of patients, you can take a large group 
and compare, for example, Pittsburgh, they probably talked about Pittsburgh B compound and other compounds that label tau protein that you can see by imaging. So in, you know, with the, with the tau markers, it's becoming pretty good. I mean, we're getting there for sure. And in Parkinson's disease, the imaging biomarkers, in other words, the things you can see in live patients using MRIs and PET scans, and SPECT scans and things like that are getting better and better. And yeah, so there will come a day when imaging, probably combined with some of the biochemical markers that we see in cerebrospinal fluid and blood, will be able to provide a definitive diagnosis in an individual patient. That's what we're aiming for. Because right now we can separate groups of patients, statistically, but we can't apply it to a single patient. We can't take a single patient and say, they definitely have this, let's treat them with this. But it's coming, for sure. Is there a connection between Parkinson's disease and celiac disease? Boy, I, I don't know of one. David, are you aware of? I, I don't think there's any firm associations, but, but because of this work, actually, Michael Schlossmark, I don't know. Involved as well. I mean, he's, oh, yeah, he's like got a whole consortium looking at, at this aspect of celiac um, and, and how it might relate to, 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 to Parkinson's. And so, so it's something that people are kind of kind of looking at, but but you know, in terms of clinical studies, you know, you have celiac, you have a higher incidence of, of Parkinson's. We don't think at this point. <coughs> Post-mortems, do you also examine the look of these um, these towels and so on in the intestines? Uh, so that is a great question. Um, yes, uh, so we look for synuclein in the intestine, um, and and for patients with Alzheimer's disease, the, the tangles have shown up in different places as well. I don't specifically look for that, and a lot of the post-mortems we get for neurodegenerative disease. The postmortem examination is restricted to the brain and spinal cord, but in those cases where it's not, yeah, we look at the appendix, we look at the, um, at the large intestine, and we look at some peripheral organs as well. I don't do it routinely for other neurodegenerative diseases, but um, but it's been described. So these various neurodegenerative proteins show up in peripheral organs. They're in the center and they're in the back. <coughs> Now, the gentleman there just asked about uh, celiac disease and Parkinson's, but does this sort of hypothesis also reflect in other diseases uh, such as autoimmune diseases like Crohn's disease? Yeah, so there's definitely a link between uh, Crohn's and Parkinson's disease, probably through a protein called LARC2, which is one of the genes that when mutated can cause, can cause Parkinson's disease. What the link is, what the actual mechanism is, I'm not too sure. Uh, I don't know if, it, if Michael knows either. Um, but, but there is a, a genetic link between Crohn's disease and even leprosy mm -hmm. and, and Parkinson's disease through this LARC2, this LARC2 protein. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot to be discovered. Yes, I was interested in methylpublioma. Seems to go along with Parkinson's. I wasn't aware of that connection, but that's very interesting because mesothelioma is one of those cancers that we ha it has a very strong link to environmental exposures, right? Like asbestos. Yeah. I'm not aware of any firm connection, no. but that's interesting. So just one, uh, sorry, there was one uh, question in the back. You've already answered, thank you. Oh, okay. and, uh, and that gentleman there, got his hand up for a Can you have Lewy body deposits without having the clinical manifestation of Parkinson? And is there a relationship between the density of those and the severity of the disease? <coughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. You can certainly have Lewy bodies uh, without the manifestations of Parkinson's disease, and we even have a name for that, and it's called incidental Lewy body disease. 
<laughs> yeah. So these are cases that you know come to to autopsy, and I examine the brain and look at the substantia nigra, and I think I'm going to go home early and connect the Lewy bodies in the substantia nigra. And uh, the patient had no clinical history of Parkinson's disease. Um, so how do you explain that? I know. So for me, these are the most fascinating cases. Like, what? Why are these patients not um, manifesting the disease? So to me, incidental Lewy body is. I, I don't have an answer for you, but I think it's fascinating. Those are a fascinating group of patients that need to be studied. The incidental Lewy body disease patients. I'm just going to take two more questions. Okay. Um, this has been a terrific presentation. I know I've learned a lot. I have a naive question. We're encouraged to eat a lot of protein. And I'm not a scientist at all, so I don't understand whether proteins convert into other proteins and how you eventually get to the tau protein. Right. Um, well, I, I, you know, proteins are an important nutritional, you know, uh, part of our diet, obviously, and we need proteins. These are, most proteins are good. Um, these proteins that turn bad, um, we need. I mean, so, you know, they come from, proteins are made of amino acids. So the proteins we eat get broken down into amino acids, and most of those get made into the good proteins that we all need. Um, obviously, the bad proteins are made of amino acids, too, but there's no way, I don't think, I mean, there are certain dietary approaches to, to these neurodegenerative diseases, but whether changing your intake of protein, I don't think that changing the amount of protein you take in is going to affect, you know, whether you develop the bad protein or not. And that's, they all come from the same building blocks. Is there any connection between the arthritis and Parkinson? That is another good question. I'm personally interested in the possible autoimmune connection to Parkinson's disease, and we know that rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease, possibly linked to a virus, like Epstein-Barr virus. Um, so in that context, maybe, but I don't know. I'm saying I don't know a lot, yeah. so maybe I should stop. <laughs> Before we close out tonight, uh, I do want to mention uh, a special thanks to some of our supporters. Uh, look, a lot of what we do is incredibly uh, complex and incredibly expensive, uh, but it's important because for example, the, the, the project uh, that uh, John just described, he got funding for uh, through CIHR, and that was because uh, his research got initially funded through PRC and So the way it works is, including, for example, Santa, thank you so much for your support, or the Donna Poole uh, uh, Fellowship, or the Audrey Grant Fellowship, she's been doing this for six years, I think, um, and Anna, the Tov Fellowships. Uh, those and other money from uh, events um, uh, really come together uh, are collected and distributed in a way that makes the most sense, <coughs> makes the most sense, and makes the most impact. So, one of our most important partners and have been for a very, very long time, uh, the PRC wouldn't uh, exist without it, uh, this organization, is Piper. Piper supported this year, uh, last year, sorry, last year, um, the, uh, the work of John Wolf um, uh, that you just heard about, um, that is starting now because of them that he was able to get the CIHR grant from the federal government. Um, they've been incredibly supportive, uh, well beyond a million dollars in the past uh, several years. Um, right now, currently, Roberta Driscoll is the, uh, the co-chair of the and if I could have you come down and say a few words. Very much. It's always amazing uh, to come here and learn about all the research that's being done in Ottawa and want to thank Dr. Park and his team for opening up the room and the researchers to uh, presentations and questions and answers because it's, you don't think Ottawa is a, we're sort of the second citizens to Toronto and the bigger cities and there's really a lot going on here and we have a lot to be grateful for. Uh, research 
cat is the uh, foundation of our call and hope, finding a cure for Parkinson's disease. And our talented researchers here uh, need our help and support to continue their work. Um, as uh, David suggested, uh, Piper was formed nine years ago. I'm one of the original members. Shelby also is one of the original members. Uh, we came together, we were a group of nine people uh, that had Parkinson's in our lives and wanted to do something to make a difference and decided to raise money for research being done here. We use Ottawa Race Weekend as our um, platform uh, to, to raise money. We use the 2K race, uh, not to make it too easy, but to make it uh, hopefully uh, able that all of our participants can complete the race. Sometimes that's true and sometimes it's not. But we do pick that race um, as our platform and um, would like to invite all of you to join us. Walking is a, is a, a lot of fun. Uh, we have formed sort of an extended Piper family and it's great to get together. And uh, Sharon Martin from the Ottawa Hospital Foundation today gave me our totals. So in nine years we've raised $1,195,495. And 36 cents. I'm not sure where the 36 cents came from, but, um, but we have all kinds of different events as well to, to raise funds, and one of which uh, my godchildren have a lemonade stand sale. <laughs> so that would come from the lemonade stand. Anyway, um, would encourage all of you to get involved and help support these amazing scientists because research costs money and we can we need as much as we can get. So please come and join us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, the range of uh, events that we do uh, to support the, uh, the research, and by the way, we're way above Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it ranges from biking to running to walking playing bridge, and uh, so we can't uh, forget the most important event, to echo something that Dave said once, the most important event, drinking. <laughs> <laughs> we have an event uh, coming up this Sunday, um, it's uh, not just drinking, it's, uh, you can if you wish, but also listening to great music, uh, celebrating uh, an informal atmosphere, uh, some great food. Um, it's this Sunday, it's at the Greenfield Pub, uh, pub I believe, um, in um, Barhaven. It's put on by Dave Hong Kong. Uh, Dave has been doing this for uh, the fifth year, fifth year. Um, and it's an incredible, it's an incredibly um, joyous event. So if you could join us this Sunday, uh, Dave is selling tickets uh, behind, it's very, very cheap. Um, and join us. Um, um, this year we're going to celebrate Shelby. Uh, it, this was actually done in, in, in honor of Shelby. Uh, um, and we're going to uh, have her as the guest of honor this year. Right, Shelby? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, just a, a pitch for that. Um, and finally, um, uh, before I say my formal thank yous, um, I've been notified that uh, please, if you have uh, plates and dishes, if you can take them. <laughs> so on that note, and, and, and I get these periodic texts on my phone, um, and they're from, they're from Rosemary here. Uh, this whole week, this has been five days of incredibly um, active, engaging talks and interactions in the community. I didn't do any of this. It was Rosemary, Natasha, Victoria, um, um, others uh, um, um, helping out all the volunteers. Um, it was incredible uh, team effort. I want to thank uh, all of them um, for putting this uh, uh, whole week on in particular today. Uh, and finally, before we uh, before we end, uh, please stick around. Uh, say hello to all the speakers. Say hello to me if you want. <laughs> say hello to Dave. Um, mingle. Um, and the final word is thank you. And thank you for being so incredibly engaged and generous to us, the scientists, the researchers. Um, it is greatly and deeply and profoundly appreciated. Thank you.